Hey everybody, um, welcome. This is my first time in the Joan North Lecture Hall. I got my Joan North um, bling on. She's like an artist. Too. I don't know if you know Joan, but she's pretty cool. Uh, really comfortable seat, so try to stay uh, awake. It's really comfortable in here. Um, uh, so uh, the first speaker is, is Noe de la Sancha. Uh, and um, I've known uh, Noe for probably about 15 years. Uh, the word in Paraguay that we would use to describe this word, our room is chuchi. It's kind of a chuchi room. Um, and uh, so Noe, uh, you'll, you'll hear about his story, um, but we ran, uh, we kind of came across each other when he was a grad student at Texas Tech uh, working in Paraguay. And just talking to him over the last couple of uh, days since he, since he got here, reminiscing, uh, one of the things that I kind of forgot about Paraguay uh, is, um, well, there's this term uh, that Mike Mars at Oklahoma coined called sapismo. And sapismo is uh, basically this idea that uh, if you're working in a really small pond, there might be a really big frog, and that really big frog dominates the pond. And Paraguay, it turns out, it's a really small pond. And so we knew some uh, big frogs in that pond, they, and they kind of made our lives Miserable. So it, it reminded us that in, in the sciences we have to na navigate the politics as well of, of all of this. Uh, and Noe and I kind of share that um, navigating the politics of Paraguay in common. Uh, so without any further ado, I just want to uh, turn this over to Noe to tell his story. Noe. Thank you. Okay. Bueno, este, muy buenas tardes, damas y caballeros. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. I do appreciate it, uh, especially being uh, right after Easter weekend. Uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to be here. So uh, I guess today I was going to talk some about uh, why I'm where I'm at and why I do sort of the type of research. Maybe talk about some experiences that have kind of helped me to shape my perception of, of life, I guess, in some ways, and how that's kind of shaped my perception of my career and what to do with things, right? So uh, I was actually born in uh, Toluca, Mexico, which is right there in central Mexico, about 45 minutes west of Mexico City. Uh, when I was uh, fairly young, uh, my parents are actually from northern Mexico, from Chihuahua, the state of Chihuahua, the biggest state in, the, in Mexico. When they uh, ended up immigrating to uh, southern New Mexico when I was fairly young. So I grew up uh, in, the, in the desert in high deserts. Every once in a while we get a little bit of snow. Now, uh, this area is extremely, extremely arid, very different from other places I've been. This is also part of my backyard, okay? So this is what I've seen. This is not new for any of you who didn't know this. This is uh, a wall that separates U.S. and Mexico. This uh, is not a new phenomena. I've known this all my life. Uh, being Mexican in this country, has uh, been challenging, to say the least, and sometimes more than others. Today is one of, nowadays, a little bit more challenging, but it's, it's part of life, right? So keep that on the back burner for a while. We'll come back to it. So uh, ever since I could remember, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I knew that I was going to be a veterinarian. I always loved working with animals. I always think about this a lot, and I remember one of the reasons why I decided to become a vet, I think, and why I'm where I am at right now, perhaps, when I was about uh, maybe like around 12 years old, uh, I asked my dad if I could get a hamster. And my dad said, sure, no problem. So we ended up going to a pet shop. And we looked at the hamsters. I looked at the one I wanted. I found a little dude. He goes, OK, cool. I'll be right back. He went around the corner, and he got this book for me. And he said, you know what? When you read this book, you can have your hamster. <laughs> so I was like, ah, oh, you. Good one. So then I uh, ended up going back home. I read this whole book in about two weeks. And he, he actually did uh, come through, and he got me the hamster. Now, as I was growing uh, older and older, Rob, I did not just throw this in there. There's a point for this. When I got to high school, we had a, a teacher who was pretty amazing. And he was one of the teachers that started teaching environmental science in high schools. And one of the things that he uh, started talking to us was about why was it that in our community, was primarily, which was primarily a low-income Hispanic community, why did we have this massive landfill right behind our home, right? Why wasn't it in the rich part of town uh, up in El Paso, right? And one of the things that he started talking to us was about inequality and injustice. 
and more so environmental injustice. And this kind of really, really, really became very uh, pronounced in my sort of my whole philosophy moving forward uh, for the rest of my, of my life, I think. So right after that, believe it or not, I ended up going uh, from uh, southern New Mexico in the desert to northern Wisconsin. So in northern Wisconsin, that's where I got my undergrad. So I ended up spending about uh, four years in a, uh, right on the base of Lake Superior right here in a, uh, in a college called Northland College, which is very similar to Stevens Point, actually. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Wisconsin. And so I, I, uh, Wisconsin has a little bit of my uh, heart, so to speak. One of the really awesome things about uh, going to school in Wisconsin is that I actually got a lot of opportunities to go outside of the United States, something that for whatever reasons I had not done as much. And one of the first places where I got to go was uh, down here to Botswana, and we took a class where we got to go to Chobe National Park. Chobe National Park is out in the Okavonga Delta. It's probably one of the most magical places you will ever see. And you get to see all these amazing, we got to be in a whole month where every day we got to wake up and see some of the most amazing fauna you'll ever see, right? And for me, after that, uh, I was kind of like, man, this veterinary de uh, deal probably isn't for me anymore, okay? And I was like, I'm going to be a wildlife biologist, you know? Well, I was also in Northland. I got to go to Costa Rica, and uh, I got to go to Central America. I got to go to this uh, landscape, right? That was the first time that I'd ever been in tropical rainforest. And when I got there, once you ever go, once you set foot in a tropical rainforest, uh, at least for me, I fell in love. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And once you go to this paradise, it's really easy to fall in love. However, this is part of Costa Rica as well. This is part of what is happening in the vast majority of tropical forests throughout the world. We're losing more and more and more of our tropical rainforests and our tropical systems. This is becoming more of the norm of what Costa Rica looks like instead of that lush, beautiful rainforest. So uh, those, all those experiences started to sort of shape my uh, philosophy about where I wanted to move uh, after this. And then I ended up uh, doing my PhD out in uh, Lubbock, Texas, out in the panhandle in the middle of, of uh, Texas Tech. And so what I did is I ended up doing my research down in eastern Paraguay. So I ended up spending the next three years on eastern Paraguay working on uh, the effects of deforestation and biodiversity. And so why biodiversity, right? Assuming that we all agree that our planet is approximately 4.5 billion years old, we have experienced already at least five major mass extinctions. All right? The last one right here was about 65 million years ago when this big, gigantic meteorite hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out all large dinosaurs, all non-avian dinosaurs. We lost a vast majority of all our biodiversity, anywhere between 70 to 90% of our biodiversity. Okay? Since then, uh, life has come back, and now we happen to be in the sixth mass extinction. That sixth mass extinction is uh, called by many the Anthropocene, right? And the main driver for the Anthropocene is this bipedal hominid, right? Homo sapien, right? And uh, the Anthropocene did not start uh, yesterday or 100 years ago. Uh, as far as we can tell, it started approximately 10,000 years ago, right? Ever since humans started uh, colonizing, or once we left uh, Africa, there's plenty of evidence that, su that suggests that every time that Homo sapien entered a new continent, we uh, started mass extinctions of megafauna all over the world. Now, this then got exacerbated uh, after the Industrial Revolution and has become uh, more and more and more and more and more and more pronounced in the last uh, few uh, centuries. Now, in 2008, there was a pretty awesome paper that came out in this uh, small journal called Science that talked about the diversity of, small of mammals on the planet. And one of the things that they concluded was that the highest number of species on the planet was between 23 degrees north, 23 degrees south of the equator. That region is called the tropics, which is this band right here. Right? Another thing that they found was that the highest, the highest uh, amount of phylogenetic diversity in the planet is also on the tropics. But then they also found that the main contributor for loss of biodiversity and the loss of species is this thing right here, which is habitat loss. Okay? loss of the original habitat where these species live. Now, ironically, the other thing that was found in this, uh, in this study was that if you look at this map right here, this is the places in the world 
where we had the highest number of newly described species to science since 1992. 1992, okay? I know for some of you this might seem like a lifetime ago, but it's not that long ago, okay? This is where we find the highest number of species in the world. And where is this? The tropics, right? Like not only that, but the other thing to keep in mind, this map right here shows the areas in the world where we have the highest uh, data deficiency for any uh, for mammals on the planet, and where do you think that is? The tropics, right? So there's the situation. The highest number of newly described species on the planet, the tropics. The place where we know the least, the tropics. The place where we're losing the most species, the tropics, right? So uh, that's why it's sort of that's how all these things kind of started to come together for me, and this is where I started developing my research uh, since then. This right here is the uh, Atlantic Forest of South America. It's the second most diverse forest system after the Amazon. Uh, historically, this is what the Atlantic Forest of uh, South America was from northeastern Brazil over here into Argentina and to Paraguay. This is approximately what we have now. We have less, uh, somewhere between 8 to 12 percent of the original uh, forest structure uh, ever since uh, uh, the Portuguese probably started coming to, uh, to, uh, to the continent. This is, uh, in many ways, the situation in Paraguay, right? As early as 1945, almost all of eastern Paraguay was almost intact. By 2007, this is what we had, approximately, somewhere between 8 to 12 percent of the original forest systems. This is 2007. This, I'm sure, is dramatically lower by now, OK? So now that everybody's all depressed now. <laughs> This is actually one of the forest remnants where I, work, uh, where I work, one of the forest reserves. And you can see that these right here, these are probably about 30 foot uh, tractors, right? So you can get an, an idea. So one of the main contributors to the deforestation in eastern Paraguay, uh, uh, the main contributor originally in the 80s was uh, cattle production, OK? So there's all this deforestation so uh, people could grow pasture, and then people used to uh, grow beef. A lot of that went to international markets primarily so we can have cheap burgers to oversimplify. It's a little bit more complex, but we don't have enough time to get into it. Right now, one of the main contributors is actually the production of soy. Okay? Now, a lot of this uh, soy right now is getting shipped to places like China so we can actually grow more uh, pork and so the, because right now the middle class in China is increasing considerably. Okay? All right. Fair enough. This is, unfortunately, one of the areas where not that long ago, as early 1980, used to be all tropical rainforest for as long as the eye could see. And now, a good chunk of it, you're lucky if you find any forest uh, remnants in some of these areas. Uh, one of the forest remnants we used to work, this was typical. Even though in many places it was illegal for, uh, de to deforest or to extract wood, this was commonplace. We used to see this all the time. We saw this, and we were researchers who were in, the, in, the for in the, those rainforests. And so uh, what I started working with was mice, mice and marsupials, little small mammals, non-volant mammals, mammals that don't fly, right? The only flying mammals that we have are uh, bats, right? Now, it just so happens that uh, rodents account for 40% of all mammal diversity on the planet, 40%. If you're an alien, you came out here and you grabbed 10 uh, mammals, four of those would be uh, rodents of some sort, okay? The other 30% is uh, included in bats. So between rats and bats, that includes approximately 70% of all mammalian biodiversity on the planet. So we wanted to go with uh, uh, rodents and marsupials. The reason for that is because they're fairly small, so we could go out and collect a bunch of them. They have uh, tremendous diversity, as I just mentioned. They have high reproductive rates. So if we collect some of them, we're not going to impact the populations. It's very likely that an owl at any particular night will have a higher impact on those populations than what we would. OK, probably a few foxes. The other thing is that for the most part, they have limited dispersal, right? So unlike bats, which are going to travel anywhere from 10 to 15 miles to go back to the roost, these little dudes, whatever we catch in any particular place, those are residents there. And so that helps us to analyze uh, diversity in that particular location. The other thing, as far as we can tell, they are fairly sensitive to deforestation. Some species are. And the other thing to keep in mind is that they have high levels of endemism. That means that many of these species are only found in the Atlantic forest uh, of South America and nowhere else on the planet. 
So this was logistically difficult, okay? Working in the tropics is not easy. There's a major wear and tear on all your equipment. And there's times when you're kind of like, your car, everything's breaking down, your, uh, uh, the things that you're carrying your equipment with starts falling apart. And just when you think it can't get any worse, it usually does get worse, okay? So this was typical of what we were doing. So it takes some serious, uh, uh, when you're working there, you really want to have to be there, okay? It's no joke. Not to mention that you're always getting uh, bit by ants, wasps, uh, spiders every once in a while. I, get, I had various, uh, I had bot flies in me at least five times. Have anybody heard of bot flies? Oh, bot flies are no joke, man. All right, so what we did is we actually used uh, Sherman Live traps. We also, we also use uh, regular snap traps, which are these types of uh, traps right here. Uh, we want to maximize the types of uh, uh, small mammals that we're catching. We also used uh, pitfalls, and pitfalls were a uh, considerable amount of work. And the idea was to uh, create a barrier through the forest where little small mammals can come, they hit that barrier, they fall, and then they would fall into a bucket that we'd go every morning and we would go try to collect and see what we caught. We got all kinds of stuff. Uh, these were pretty uh, useful not only for, um, for small mammals, but for all kinds of herptofauna, for tarantulas, for beetles, for all kinds of stuff. We got a few snakes. Uh, all the, everything we uh, caught in the field, we processed uh, in the field. We did taxidermy of all the specimens that we collected. We got DNA samples so we could then come and process. These were all our voucher specimens, many of which are now housed in the Field Museum in Chicago. Okay? So many of you would say, well, why would you go and kill all these little cute little animals, right? And one of the things to keep in mind is that we don't know squat about what we have in Paraguay. Okay? Now, when I was in Paraguay, we were collecting this little mouse right here, which I thought was Akinon montensis. We thought that thing was taking over the forest. Uh, it turns out, when we come back, one of the ways to identify mammals is through these little, uh, through the teeth, through the molars. Mammals actually uh, tend to change in their morphology of their uh, molars based on what they eat fairly quickly. At the same time, species morphology uh, tends to be very conservative. So uh, within, between species, there's a lot of change. Within the species, same shape. And so one of the things that we found was there is this new species that had been described recently just in 2000 in Brazil. One of the best ways, one of the big characteristics of this species was that little invagination right there, that little groove, right? And that allowed us to identify Acheron paranaensis. So we went back, we started looking at the little uh, jaw bones on many of our mice. We started finding uh, those little uh, invaginations. And sure enough, we started finding Acheron paranaensis all over the place. And the reason why we need to do this is because that totally changes our understanding, our quantification of biodiversity. Okay? All right. So uh, during a postdoc that I did uh, up in Rhode Island, I ended up uh, having to go learn how to do DNA. Okay? Now, one of the things to keep in mind, I was talking about this earlier today, when I started off in Paraguay, I thought I was going to be a hardcore ecologist. That's what I was going to be. I was going to be in the field. I was never going to deal with this taxonomy stuff, okay? Well, very quickly, I realized that we don't know anything about that taxonomy of many species of Paraguay. So by default, I had to become a taxonomist. Then I thought, I never want to go work with DNA. I don't want to be stuck in a lab. Very quickly, I realized that in order for me to understand what species we, are, we even have, in order to quantify biodiversity, we have to do DNA because for a lot of these specimens, even with the molars, we couldn't even identify what we had. Okay? So what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is two things. Biodiversity is the number of species that you find in any particular place times the number of individuals per species that we get. This is biodiversity. And therefore, if we would have let go of so many of these little dudes that we thought that they were one species, our understanding of biodiversity in these forest remnants would have been completely and totally different. Okay? So now more and more and more, uh, I've had to learn about museum science, and now I'm a research associate at the Field Museum, and this has become a big part of the types of research that we're doing right now. And right now at Chicago State, we're doing all kinds of work where we, we are doing all kinds of different morphological uh, pro uh, projects with students uh, that I have here at Chicago State. Uh, we've been able to develop all kinds of stuff that deal with uh, variation in, uh, throughout age, with ontogeny and all this stuff. But the big picture here is that all these uh, different studies have allowed us to better understand biodiversity in Paraguay. All right. Since 2008, more or less, 
In Paraguay, we've been able to document several new species of uh, marsupials, various rodents, uh, at least one species of bat, several species of, um, of legomorphs, which are uh, rabbits, and we also had uh, a new armadillo species that had never been reported for Paraguay. This is just since 2008, okay? I know for some of you, 2008 seems like a lifetime ago, but that was yesterday in the grand scheme of things. Point to be made, we still don't know squat, nothing. We just started a review of the species of Paraguay, and we found that we have approximately 182 species. The last review from 2002 only documented 156 species of mammals in the whole planet. Uh, not only this, in the planet, in Paraguay. One of the big things to keep in mind is that we're not talking about little tiny things, okay? We've realized that we don't even know what uh, species of armadillos we have in Paraguay. We haven't been able to get a good record for uh, sloths, which are fairly large animals in Paraguay. We don't know what is the proper uh, name for the species of, sub, uh, of subspecies that we have of cougars in Paraguay. Even middle-sized cats, we've not been able to identify a good name that correctly represents the species from Paraguay. And a big reason for that is because we don't have a lot of DNA to document these species. Skunks, we don't know exactly what we have. And even tapirs, which are these big, massive animals, uh, probably the largest animal in Paraguay, we have not been able to really clarify what species of tapir we have in Paraguay. And the reason is because there's still a lot of research, basic research, that has not been conducted in this country. So before we start doing conservation, before we start doing management, we don't have the luxury that we have in places here like the United States where we know all the fauna. We don't. And this is very, very uh, typical of the tropics. And this is very challenging, but this is also an awesome opportunity, right? So if you are a young whippersnapper who wants to go out to the tropics, who wants to describe new species, who wants to be able to put a whole uh, understanding on, on the biodiversity that we have on the planet, there's still immense amount of opportunities all over the tropics. Once again, we still don't know uh, what types of peccaries we have, right? And even right now, the nomenclature of uh, peccaries that we thought we really knew, and ironically, this is a species that's best known in Paraguay, the name was just changed just uh, a few months ago. So we still don't know squat. Now, one of the really cool things, and I, I wasn't even going to put this in it, I uh, decided to put this today. One of the really cool things about one of the reserves that we worked in is that uh, we actually had a huge opportunity to work with a lot of native groups in the area. Okay? These are uh, some of the Ache uh, people. One of the really amazing things about Paraguay, for example, which is very unique from any other uh, country in South America, is that uh, uh, Guarani is a, one of the true official languages in Paraguay. That means that we have actually, uh, well, the first official language is Spanish, but the second one is Guarani. And when I mean that it's official, it means that even the president and senators, whenever they talk, when they give their discourses, when they give their, their address to the, to the nation, they give them in Guarani. You don't see that anywhere in the whole Americas. So this is pretty amazing and pretty extraordinary. And so uh, we've been using this data to sort of come up with ways that we can model potentially what is happening in Paraguay as we have more and more and more deforestation, okay? So this is how we've been able to uh, implement all our understanding to better improve areas of management and areas of conservation. If you want to ask me more about this, I can tell you more about it afterwards if we have time. So I just want to shift gears to a few more stories really quickly. First thing is uh, after I finished, I got a postdoc. I ended up going to University of Rhode Island. I got the opportunity to work with this awesome uh, gentleman who gave me the opportunity to lead a trip to Kenya. Okay, so this was one of my uh, multiple times that I got to go to Kenya. It was a mind-blowing experience. I got to experience, see some of the coolest fauna. We got to take various students where we got to go every day and uh, look at rodents I've never even seen. Got to see some really cool medium-sized animals, once again, that I hadn't seen before. And so that was extremely uh, important because that got me to where we are right now. And right now we've started a project in Ivory Coast, in Côte d'Ivoire. If there's any of you who don't know where Côte d'Ivoire is, this is in West Africa. And one of the things that we started is we started to explore biodiversity in uh, cacao-dominated landscapes. Now cacao, in case you don't know, is where chocolate comes from. Who here does not like chocolate? I thought so. Okay. 
So one of the things to keep in mind, and if you didn't raise your hand, you lost your chance there. You, that was your chance to say you didn't like chocolate. Everybody likes chocolate, right? There's nobody who doesn't like chocolate. Now, ironically, 40% of all the chocolate on the planet comes from Ivory Coast. Another uh, potentially 30% uh, of the world's chocolate is coming from this other country right here, which is Ghana. The other thing to keep in mind, another good chunk of uh, cacao on the planet is coming from uh, Southeast Asia, which ironically, this was an American crop. And by America, I mean that it comes from the Americas, right? Because America is two continents. America is from Canada all the way to Argentina. It's not one country. And this is something that we all got to remember. Okay? Now, this is Ivory Coast, in case you don't know where it is. This is what cacao looks like. This is what the pods that we've been uh, looking at. And the basically, right now, what we're trying to do is sort of come up, implement a lot of the techniques that we were using to try to see what the impact of cacao is on uh, rainforests around cacao-dominated uh, landscapes, right? Uh, this is another one of my students right now. We've actually started to do the same sort of uh, things that I was talking about, where we're starting to talk about uh, biodiversity on cacao forests and see what the impact of this one monoculture is having of what used to be a contiguous uh, rainforest, right? So once again, this is work that we've been doing at the Field Museum. We are trying to identify all the species that we have. We're doing a lot of morphology work, and we're also doing DNA work. Okay, and so I wanna leave you off with this. And this is uh, something that I had been thinking about that was really interesting to me. And this has been part of my last experience, especially going back and back and back to different parts of Africa. To me, one of the things that was very ironic now that I think about is that I had to go to Sub-Saharan Africa to understand what it means to be white. Let me explain this to you. I grew up as a Mexican American in this country. I'm an immigrant. I've always been looked as a minority, right? I got to, uh, <laughs> first time I went to Kenya, uh, I got there and they're like, every morning, like some of the teachers there would be like, hey, Muzungu. Muzungu, it means white man, right? First time in my life, somebody called me a white man. And I was kind of like, white man, oh, interesting, right? Uh, and so that was really interesting to me because I'd be like, well, you know, I'm, I'm Mexican, I'm Latino, I'm not really white. They're like, they're like well, are you black? I was like, well, no, I'm not black. I was like, you're a white man. And so it was interesting in two ways, right? Because first of all, I got to see the separation between how people viewed me in some ways as part of the people who were coming in and invading and, and lots of other negative connotations. But the other interesting part, and this is why I put this uh, picture in, is it was amazing how doors magically opened for me everywhere I went. All of a sudden, I was able to talk to highly influential people. All of a sudden, I was able to go get permits. All of a sudden, I was able to go to places where most Kenyans and more, where most Ivorians don't get to go because I was white, because I was a white man, right? And so that, to me, has changed my life in ways that this is one of the things that we got to keep in mind, right? This is what we got to be open to. And this is what this, to me, this is what this whole thing is about. It's about understanding privilege. Privilege comes in many ways in different places where you're at. It has to do with gender. It has to do with social economics. It has to do with education. Obviously, there's a big race component. Obviously, there's a big age component. Abilities, languages, right? And it's important that when we're talking about various disciplines, even academia, where we're supposed to be really enlightened, we're supposed to be open-minded, we're supposed to be all this stuff, right? It's more and more uh, that it's important that we realize all these privileges. And to me, when I, was, uh, when I got to Africa, it made me think about, it. if all I know is this privilege, whatever that part of this privilege thing is, if that's all you know, it's very easy to get into the mindset that if I'm here, why can't you make it? Why can't you make it? Why can't you make it? Why can't you and you, whoever you want to call the you? Because you didn't work hard enough. Because you didn't push yourself harder, you know? Because whatever, you know? And to me, that's one of the big privileges that Africa has given me. 
And when we talk about these types of discussions and this type of thing, this is why it's so important that we do have different faces that are going into these disciplines, right? Because there's different perspectives and different viewpoints about how to address resource management, right? From the voices that are not usually heard, right? So with that in mind, uh, I swear probably we should stop off. There are all the amazing people that have always helped me out. I am extremely grateful to all these people. More than anybody, I need to be uh, extremely grateful to my wife and uh, my little girl, Lisa. Uh, thanks to Rob for giving me the opportunity to come here. Uh, to all the crews that have helped me out on, in the field. Uh, I'd like to thank Chris for, his, uh, for all his support and help and his kind words. Uh, and all the people at the Field Museum. So if there's any questions, time for questions, I will do my best to answer some of them. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, with your work in Paraguay, uh, you showed a lot of the results you found with uh, your mammalian analysis. Did you uh, also have a part of your team that was working with uh, documenting and inventorying the herps as well? Or any herps. That's a great question, actually. I'm glad, uh, glad you pointed it out. Yeah, I didn't have time to really talk too much about other stuff. Uh, one of the guys who was my, uh, my right-hand guy, he was a herpetologist. And uh, we always had a, a three-year battle where I was trying to convert him to the dark side to become a mammalogist, and I, I never succeeded. But he actually collected all kinds of uh, frogs, all kinds of... Actually, right now we have a little... We're this close. We've been trying to uh, write this up for several years now. We got a new species of blind snake. That is, uh, we, we have plenty of evidence to suggest that it's a new blind, a new species to science. We're trying to work on that. We actually have huge amount of records of frogs that we collected throughout that time. That's on the back burner. That's something that we want to process and we want to publish at some point. Uh, we collected all kinds of uh, lizards, and uh, many of those lizards we actually deposited in the museum collections in Asuncion in Paraguay. And so, uh, yeah, there's lots of there's lots of cool stuff, yeah, for sure. Yes, ma'am. I, I was wondering about that. Yeah, I, I don't know where that came from. Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> Castilian versus non-Castilian? I'm not sure. I think that was, I don't know. That's a great, I didn't put that, so oh, okay. I don't know. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> uh, I guess maybe Argentine Spanish, I don't know. That's probably my fault. Oh, no worries, no worries, <laughs> no worries. Or I guess if you would just put Castilian, then touche. Yes, sir. Uh, right now, no, we haven't uh, been able to name any yet. Uh, we do have uh, several things that we're processing right now that we're trying to get uh, going. Uh, in Paraguay, we haven't been able to describe new species for science yet, but we definitely had plenty of new species records for Paraguay. Um, we have a few things that we are pretty sure they're new species, but you'd be surprised how long that takes. It's a lot of work because you actually, if you do this properly, you have to go uh, you have to justify why you think this is a new species. So you can use morphology, and that means that you have to go to various other museums, natural history museums all over the world. If you're doing a good job, you have to go look at the holotype. The holotype would be the first specimen that was used to describe that one species. Many of them are in places like the British Museum in England. Some are in the Smithsonian, maybe the American Museum, depending where those species were collected. So it takes a while. It takes a while. But we're working on it. We're working on it. Yeah, so hopefully soon. Oh, we did get to describe a new species of, uh, of, uh, of a parasitic worm that we got from a, uh, from a mouse. So we did get to name that. That's pretty cool. No, no. Actually, when, when you're doing uh, taxonomy, you usually, it's, it's considered impolite to name things after yourself. You can name it after your grandma and your mom or whoever, but, eh? <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> Yes, ma'am.
leave. Go somewhere else. Go to a country where you're the minority, whatever that means. I mean, I don't know what a minority even means, but go somewhere where you're not uh, the normal person, you know? Go to South Korea, go to Indonesia, go to Mongolia, you know? Go somewhere where you don't speak the language, right? Where you see what it's like for people to struggle to communicate with somebody independent of how intelligent you are, right? To be humbled, you know? That's important. That's really important. Those are the types of experiences that you only get when you leave your comfort zone. If you're from Wisconsin, leave Wisconsin. I guarantee you that happens like that. Go travel with a backpack through Mexico or Central America. Go uh, to Southeast Asia. Go to uh, Europe even, you know? Go to uh, Germany, somewhere where you don't even speak the language. I think once you have to struggle through those situations, I think you're more likely to be more sympathetic uh, to other people who are not like you. And there's nothing, and I'm not saying that there's, let's be clear, okay? I'm not saying that I'm not putting any judgment on anybody, whether you're a good person, bad person, whatever. What I'm saying is, is that it's wise to be mindful. It's wise to be, take a step back and think about that not everybody's like me. And there's every, the reason why people have these perceptions about politics, about religion, about whatever, is because of the consequences of all kinds of stuff, right? The more people from different cultures that you interact with in their uh, shoes, but in their land, that's when you start to understand. When you go learn about, uh, about Japan or about Japanese people in Japan, then you start getting it. When you go to Paraguay to learn about Paraguayans, then that's when you get it. When you go to Mexico to learn about Mexicans and not from a Taco Bell commercial, then that's when you start to get it, hopefully. And if you don't, I, I, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I hope that answers some of your questions. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Of course, of course, in the United States, in the United States, public education, eh, public education in the United States uh, comes from uh, taxes on real estate, right? So it's kind of self-perpetuating problem, right? If you come from a low-income community, the tax base is less. That means that your schools are going to be poor. If you're poor, you, can hire, you, you cannot hire the best qualified teachers. You can't have all these awesome programs, you know? My high school, for example, was extremely low income, you know? Uh, to say the least, education was subpar, right? We had a huge, massive uh, gang violence problem, okay? Uh, we had lots of problems that were, uh, had to do with violence and with uh, social economics. Because if you are in a situation where you don't have parents because they're working two or three jobs, what kind of an education are you going to have to begin with, right? If you're uh, in a situation where you don't have access, uh, if all you're doing is just going to school just so you can have uh, the lunch that day, the free lunch, how are you going to be focusing on school, you know? If every time you go home, you have to be avoiding these streets and this street and this street so you don't get beat up or potentially shot, which is actually a big part of what happens also at Chicago State where I teach, my university. I'm not talking about high school, I'm talking about my university. How are you going to be able to concentrate on physics, on calculus, on whatever? At some point that becomes irrelevant, right? Am I afraid about, you know, and there's actually, there's been a lot of really cool studies that have shown that the more stressed out you are, the, the more cortisol, different types of hormones that you produce, the more stressed out you are, the less you're, li you're likely to be able to think clearly throughout your life. And if you think about it, if you're stressed out from the second you wake up to when you go to bed, how are you supposed to learn? Especially when you're going to a low-income high school or institution where the resources aren't even there to begin with. You know? So there's a direct correlation between all that stuff. So yes, I agree. There is less education. A lot of it is associated with social economics. Yes, ma'am.
I got lucky. I was fortunate. My parents were always awesome. My dad, my dad, if I call him right now, he'd drop everything, get in a car, and come here if I needed to, for him to come. And I was, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm extremely lucky. But I was also, uh, I don't know, I was lucky. I was lucky, and also I was a big nerd. So <laughs> those are two things that I, made, I was really lucky about, right? Yes, ma'am. Right. Right, 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 right. Uh, wow. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. Well, uh, I don't claim to be a, an authority, they're not Yoda or anything, but uh, I would say that, um, so I was talking to a, uh, a young man uh, earlier today, and I think I think it's, it's wise of all of us to try to become as educated as you possibly can about especially the interface between uh, our everyday lives, our consumptions, in this uh, perspective, environmentalism and politics. They're all related. Everything in life is politics. And I'm not talking about what political party you belong to. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, we are social primates. Everything we do is politics. Every day, every time you interact with somebody, there's some politicking going on, right? You're trying to interact with him, with her, blah, 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 blah. You like him, but you don't like him because he likes her, da, 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 da. That's politics. We see this every day in everything, right? I think it's important that we become as educated as we can about core issues as possible, right? Independent of what political viewpoint you have, it's important that you can justify why you feel that uh, thing, you know? I have some of my really good friends are, are, are hardcore Republicans. Uh, in case you didn't pick up, I'm not, that, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think that's important that you should be able to justify why you have that belief system, okay? As a scientist, uh, I believe in evidence, and I believe in data, not feelings. Feelings are not going to get us to solve these problems. Data is. Problem solving is. And I think the bigger thing is we've got to go out there and try to live in somebody else's shoes. It seems, sounds a little cliche, but like I was telling her, get out of here, you know? Go somewhere else. Go see, what, go see what real tough situations are like in Bolivia, in Paraguay, in Mexico. Why are people from Mexico coming to the United States? There's lots of reasons for that, right? And a big part of that is because of exploitation by the United States on Mexico for almost 300 years, you know? It's a feedback cycle. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Not only that, but ironically, from Texas to California, that used to be Mexico. You know, there's people who are Mexican. This, this was our land, you know. And ironically, people want to sit up a wall to keep 
our people out of the what was used to be ours. And it's not even ours because there is people before us. There's many Native American groups before us. The Navajo, Apache, whatever. That's their land. We're all invaders. All of us. If you're not Apache, if you're not Native American, we're all invaders. So start setting up walls for who? For what? That's irrelevant. That makes no sense. I mean, maybe it would have helped out if we would have put a, a wall against Texas way back in the day, right? We wouldn't be in this mess, ironically. I'm curious if you can draw any corollaries from us or for us uh, with the work you've done studying sort of small mammals and taking that and sort of extrapolating it to us as a larger species and anything that you would say you're learning from that study that we should either be aware of or that we might be ignorant of that you might sort of enlighten us to as it relates to studying field mice and being able to say, and this is why it's important from uh, a homo sapien perspective. Sure. I mean, yeah, I think I'm going to steal some of your ideas today. So uh, if we think about it, one of the things that we start seeing, right, with mice and with other mammals, as more and more of their habitat starts to disappear, eventually gets to the point where they lose so much of their habitat that they eventually go extinct, right? We are not unique to that. We are not special. One of the things that I always talk about, right, uh, to my classes, if we were to get this whole table right here, right, let's assume that that's the whole uh, diversity of, this is, this is the timeline of our planet, this whole table right here, right? Let's assume that it's 4.5 billion years. We take off the 0.5 over there and start, let's say it's 4 billion years. Get half of this, this is going to be 2 billion years, right? Get half of this, it's going to be 1 billion years. 1 billion years. Get half of this, this is 500 million years, right? This is when a lot of vertebrates explode in diversity. Divide that in half, 250 million years, 125 million years, 75 million years, 35 million years, uh, 15 million years, 7.5 million years. You get to this point, this is 1 million years. Homo sapien has been on our planet, as far as we can tell, for 200,000 years. 200,000, you have to multiply it by 5 to get to 1 million. 1 million. The time that hum Homo sapien has been on our planet is a little sliver on this massive thing. So the point to be made is that this bipedal primate, we're not special. We're just as likely to go extinct as large dinosaurs who were around for 150 million years. We haven't even made it to 1 million years. We're not special. If we pollute our, our, our waters, if we pollute our soils, we pollute our water, our, our air, that's finite. <coughs> if we pollute it, there's no more. We don't have another planet to go to. This is what we got. If we trash it all up, where are we going to go? There's nowhere to go. So I guess that's my correlation. We're just as vulnerable as any other species, as any other mammalian or any other species. And if we're not careful, we're going to be one of the first species that was able to do something about its own extinction, and we were the main drivers for our own extinction. And that's a sad, sad thing from a universal perspective. Just a thought. But I don't know. Why do I know? I'm just some guy. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. So I don't want to take any more.